Hello, my name is Brad Payne. I work for an organization called College Golf Fellowship. It's a ministry to college golfers and coaches. The name pretty much gives it away, doesn't it? For the next 15 minutes or so, we're going to look uh, at a passage in Luke 7. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. And as you're turning, let me just tell you a story. You're a part of this story. Let's say you get invited uh, as a guest to a party that ends all parties. It's where everyone wants to go. The host is a man of high society. He is well-connected religiously, uh, in the culture, in, in politics. Um, he's a gentleman that uh, everyone knows of, but don't really um, knows him well, deeply. Um, he's a very standoffish gentleman, but he makes everyone very uncomfortable when he's around him. And this host has invited many people to see his invited speaker. And this speaker is a lot different. Um, he's welcoming, um, but he wants to kind of get to know him and also let everyone know that he knows him and is connected with him. And so as you show up, you kind of blend into the background, almost into the kitchen, but you are in the background up against the paint and you don't want anyone to know that uh, you shouldn't be there because you know you shouldn't be there. But as you walk around, you're seeing these uh, elite folks, high society folks, kind of blending in well, talking about everything that you really don't care much about. And as this awkward time uh, begins to, the mill starts to begin, there is a woman that shows up. Um, and her name is Awkward. Uh, if you thought the, the evening was awkward, it got really awkward because she wasn't supposed to be there and everyone knew she wasn't supposed to be there. And in fact, everyone kind of looked to the ground because if they knew her, that means that it condemned them as well because she was a woman of the city or let's just say a prostitute. Her dress was too, too high. Her heels were too high. Uh, she was dressed not for the occasion. And as she made her way through the crowd, everyone just scattered. Uh, the host was extremely embar uh, embarrassed. In fact, I was embarrassed for him. You were embarrassed for him. But she continued on, even as the other people told her to get out. But she was bent on seeing this speaker. And as she walked up to him, everyone was scattered. So it was just her and this speaker. And she fell at his feet, crying. And she says these three words, I am yours. And so everyone looks around and going, oh no, what is this guy going to do? Well, what he does is he picks her up, embraces her, and says, yes, you are mine and I am yours as well. Could you imagine, uh, what were you thinking at that time? What do you think the host was thinking? Um, it was a very awkward evening. And that kind of sets the table for Luke 7. And this is what we're going to do is look through the lens of this man named Christ. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And behold, a woman of the city, who was a sinner, when she learned that he was reclining at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet and her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he answered, Say it, teacher. A certain money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, The one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet 
with her tears and wipe them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this? Who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And there you have it. You have Simon, the Pharisee, the good guy in the story. You have the prostitute, her name we'll call awkward, and you have Christ. The setting is in Simon's home, and in that day, uh, a Pharisee would have a pretty good size home, and in any good size home, there would be a public area. Kind of like for you and I, we would have a, our garage to where people could walk by and, and say hello, ask questions, see how you're doing, and they could banter back, and that's what it was like in this story. Uh, they were talking and having a meal and people could walk by, sit on the wall and give their thoughts, their questions and just listen in to the conversation. And so let's just take each character one by one and we'll start with Simon the Pharisee. Uh, a Pharisee by name was a separatist. He was a separate individual. He would take his life and remove it from society and he would be devoted to the law of God. And so Simon, um, he, he was trying to, in a sense, control his own faith, control his own life, control his own purity. The land, his, the promised land, Israel, was already defiled by Rome. Rome was there, and so he couldn't control that. He couldn't remain pure in the land, and so he would keep his home very sacred, and he would keep his body very sacred. He was a religious man and everyone knew it. So the observations that I have by him as we progress through the story is, is first he was intrigued by Jesus. Well, he entered into a conversation with him, invited him over and says, hey, come have dinner with me. And so Christ did. He was intrigued probably because he was a man of God. He liked what he had to say. He probably disagreed with him, but he wanted to know what he was like. He wanted to kind of lift the hood and see what was underneath. And so he had a meal. And so he was intrigued by him that he might be a man of God or even a prophet. And as the meal goes on and the prostitute enters and she touches him, probably his thoughts were solidified that this guy was a little bit nuts. He wasn't who he said he was. He wasn't, um, in his mind, a prophet. So he dismissed Jesus. He was intrigued first and then he dismisses him as a prophet or even a man of God because one, uh, he didn't know the woman was a prostitute and two, he would never have touched a sinner because the Pharisee would have never done the two. He was appalled that she would even enter his home and defile his home because he wanted to keep it pure. So he was intrigued, he dismissed him as a prophet and then lastly, he was just appalled by him. Only God could save sinners. Only God can forgive sins, as you see at the end of the uh, story, at the end of the parable. In the end, he really had no need of forgiveness, and that's why he was appalled by Christ's offer to forgive sins. His goodness was good enough to save him. And so that's, that's the Pharisee, that's Simon, that's the good man, that's the religious man. He was intrigued by Jesus, but he dismissed Jesus. And in the end, he was appalled at Jesus that he would forgive anyone's sins. Only God could do that. And so look with me at Matthew and what it has to say about Christ's thought on a Pharisee. In speaking of the Pharisees, he said this, They do not practice what they teach. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Pretty harsh. So that's Simon, the good guy. 
Now let's move on to the second individual, which is the prostitute, Mrs. Awkward. Um, she is, by definition, a woman of the city, as that the passage says. Um, she is the bad girl. But you see her do some things throughout the text that really ex tell you that she had already placed her faith in Christ, that she didn't just see Jesus as a religious leader, um, a guest speaker, um, a good man, or even a godly man, but she was the, he was the savior of the world who took away her sins. And so she was madly in love with this individual for what he had already done in her life. So her affections moved her into uh, some things. Her love for Christ moved her into a few things that you see in the passage. So first of all, in verse 37, you see the alabaster flask where she takes the ointment and pours it over his feet later on in the passage. That was one of the most prized possessions that she had, uh, probably the most expensive thing that she owned, and she willingly, in tears, gave it over to her Savior. Number two, you see her uh, just take all of her dignity, whatever she had, and she runs into a party that she wasn't really invited to. And she takes down her hair and with her tears washes her Savior's feet with her hair. And you think, okay, hair, what's the big deal? Well, let's just say this. Uh, you never in that day would ever take down your hair unless you were in the bedroom. Does that make sense? The only time you uh, are in your bedroom in this day was to sleep and to have relations with, or to have sex with your partner. And so what this was like, um, as some people would say, is really uh, for a woman to run around her own city without uh, a stitch of clothing on. That was embarrassing. Uh, that would do some damage to your reputation, some serious damage to your reputation. And so you see with her, she gave all of her possessions to him. All of her dignity was transferred from, I don't care what people think because my Jesus, my Savior, has saved me. She was running around in a sense without any clothes and she did not care one bit. And then the last thing was is her life. She knew she was forgiven much and so she gave her life completely to her Savior. She loved much. Her forgiveness moved her into a sweet, devoted relationship with her Lord. Uh, read with me in 47. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. Or you could say it this way. One can see that her many sins are forgiven because she loved me much. And so let's move on to the hero of the story. First of all, you have the good guy, the religious guy, the Pharisee, Simon. Then you have the bad girl, the awkward girl, the prostitute. And then you, now you have Christ. A few things that we see about Christ is, is that he goes into Simon's home and so first of all he, he welcomes all people he eats with all people he invites a relationship to all people with him uh, you, you see the prostitute how he allows her to touch him and that makes us feel good inside that's that's sweet we go yes he invites all sinners to him but he also sits down and eats with a Pharisee. He welcomes him into the party as well. He welcomes the self-righteous. In fact, you see um, in the prodigal son, the older brother, that he pleads with him to come into the party. And so he, he pleads with people into a relationship with him, the righteous, the self-righteous, and the sinner. So he welcomes all people. And then you see his forgiveness is offered not as a prophet, but as the very Son of God. You see these little pieces uh, throughout this passage 
where you see his godness. He reads Simon's mind because Simon talks really softly. Uh, he says to himself, and then what Christ does is he answers his thoughts. Uh, that shows his godness. Uh, that he knew right when she came in, obviously she was dressed like a, a prostitute, but he knew she was a sinner. Uh, he knows all of us are sinners, doesn't he? And then he has the unique ability to forgive sins. In the end, a right standing before God was determined by their, Simon's, and the prostitute's attitude towards Christ. A right standing before God was determined by their attitude of the Savior, Christ. So you see, uh, he welcomes all folks. He offers forgiveness. And then Christ's forgiveness, Christ's forgiveness leads us to a radical love. He accepts the sinner. He links his identity with sinners like you and I. He is appalled by self-righteousness. Why? Because he didn't need to come if we believe that we can save ourselves. So let's just through, um, through an illustration here. Let's look at the good religious man. The good religious man has no need for God. He has no need for a Messiah. Uh, he doesn't believe that he sins. He boxes God up to say, I can do a few things and not do a few things and I'm good before God. I don't need forgiveness. Forgiveness is honestly appalling. A savior is appalling. And so his view, the Pharisees' view of, of God, or even Christ, is kind of like our view of the moon. Um, I can go days and days without even noticing the moon is in the sky. Uh, when I see it, it's, it's nice. I go, man, that's, that's a beautiful full moon. And I might look at it for a, a short period of time, and then I move on. Like you and I, we might play a, a good round of golf, and we go... Man, thank you, Lord, for that. Or we might be going 95 in a 60 or even in a school zone. I'm not saying that I've done that. Um, well, yeah, I have. Going uh, 60 even in a school zone and I don't get stopped. Or I almost run into a car and in the last minute I move out of the way and I go, oh, thank you, Lord, for that. Uh, and even, we might even... Uh, go to a party that we probably shouldn't have been at and we stayed a little longer than we should have. We drank too much that we should have and somehow we ended up in our bed uh, without any cuts or bruises um, or anyone laying beside me. And we might raise our glass and go, hey, thank you, Lord, for protecting me because all your buddies were talking about how crazy you were and it was by a very miracle that you are still alive. And so on occasion, we might see a little bit of Jesus or a little bit of God in our daily life, but we really don't care much about it, just like the moon. But with this woman, we see her relationship with God via through Christ is like the sun. Uh, if the sun didn't arise today, I would know it immediately. Where is it? Where is it? Because I know a lot of things that about the sun that if it doesn't show up, I am not going to be around much longer. It holds gravity. Um, it holds our climates. It holds this beautiful idea of photosynthesis, which makes our plants grow, which allows our animals to eat from and grow and allows me to eat. If the sun didn't show up today, I wouldn't be living tomorrow. The sun, it is life. It doesn't support life. It is life. And so, what does your relationship with the Lord look like? What does your relationship with the living, breathing God look like? Who do you resonate with? Do you resonate with the Pharisee who you, you think he might be a good guy? I'll call you when I need you. Um, but if he doesn't play in the way which you want him to play, you'll just dismiss. And even sometimes you might be even appalled by God. 
Or are you like the prostitute, the sinner, who is in desperate need of a Savior? So, as you go about today, just think about that. Um, how desperate are you for Christ? Do you need him every moment of the day, like we need the sun? Or is he like the moon to you? I'll notice you when I see something supernatural or see something pretty that makes me go, wow. And so as you go today, uh, just think about those things. Is my relationship with Christ one of desperation, where I'll give everything to have him, where I will sell all my possessions to be with him? where my dignity is secondary so I can be close to him because he has forgiven much. Thank you for listening. Have a beautiful day.